Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Cockle Bay. Uh, next up, we have Jacob Nabaglo uh, for a really exciting talk. So please welcome him on, onto the stage. Hello. I'm Jacob Nabaglo. I work at TripleByte, and I'm here to talk about bad things. Now, many programming languages let you do bad things. Um, C has its preprocessor, which is Turing complete. Um, C++ templates have resulted in some awful, awful code, including from my coworkers. Um, all of JavaScript. <laughs> if you want to complain, just hit me up on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> um, so today, I'd like to talk about bad things in Python. So Python already has uh, support for functions and classes as first class objects, which means that you can already do a bunch of bad things and some pretty bad metaprogramming. Um, but it also has some more advanced features that let you do even more bad things. So starting small, we'll talk about the locals and globals dictionaries. Um, we'll talk about inspecting the call stack and seeing things that we perhaps should not be seeing. And finally, we'll talk about looking at the bytecode of functions and playing around with that and seeing what happens. Let's start small. I hope you've all used C profile because it's a fantastic way to figure out which parts of your code you should be optimizing. So I have a function that is slow and I want to optimize it. So I um, get C profile, I um, tell it to run this particular command and I have to pass in those two things, a globals thing and a locals thing. What are they? Well, in summary, globals returns a diction the globals dictionary and locals returns a dictionary listing all the locals. Um, this is an important distinction, as we shall see. So um, this is a boring detail, but it does become useful later on. Local variables are different from global variables. If you set a variable inside your function, um, then it's actually treated differently as a variable that is set at the module level. Um, and functions are generally set at the module level. So a local, so local dictionary, so local variables are stored in a big array. Um, so for example, I have four local variables here. I have string, I have rotated letters, I have letter, and I have rotated number. So those are all stored in, in an array. So when the interpreter sees one of those locals variables, well, local variables, we can, it can just jump straight into this array and pull it right out. Uh, without having to do weird dictionary lookups. Um, and in fact, when we execute things, we forget the names completely. We just assign a number to each of them, and it makes things a lot faster. So locals lists all the local variables as a dictionary, but the underlying data structure is an array, so that doesn't really work. So changing the value in the dictionary returned by the locals functions does not actually change the underlying value in your function. Um, globals, however, are actually an, a dictionary uh, in, the, in Python's internal representation, which means, that, which means that globals just returns that dictionary, which means that changing the value changes the globals of the module. Um, and at the module level, they are the same, uh, the, the locals and globals. So you end up with this weird inconsistency where sometimes changing the locals does things, sometimes it doesn't. This is related to the dictionary of an object, the dunda dict, um, where if an object has a dunda dict, and oftentimes they don't, uh, what it does is it lists all the attributes of the object that are unique to that object and not part of, for example, the class, and the value as well. <coughs> so why do we need the locals and the globals? Well, they're a convenient way to save the state that your function is currently executing within, and you, know, you can save it or you can pass it to a different function. And in this case, we need to make sure that C profile can see string concatenate, which is a global, and it, we need to make sure that it can see many strings, which is a local, so we need to pass both those things in um, for our command to be able to execute. Okay, let's move on to slightly more interesting things, which is talking about the call stack. Um, there is a function, a built-in function called exec, which lets you put in any string and it will execute as a Python statement. So for example, here we can put in print a plus b and it will execute this um, knowing what a is, knowing what b is, but hang on, we haven't actually passed in 
our local's dictionary. So what's going on? Similarly, um, if you have an exception um, and you're printing the trace back, normally this happens when your exception is not caught, but even if you catch an exception, you can still print this, and it's often very useful for de debugging purposes. Um, you can see the state of the functions that are below you, which normally you're not able to see. Let me explain how the call stack works for a little bit. So I have a function um, that calls a few other functions. So I have a fun my function rotates string, and it does a few things. Um, the basic function that executes whenever you execute any Python code is the module. The module calls my function rotate string, and that gets put on top of the stack. The stack saves the state of the function that you're executing. Um, and when we call rotate string, everything inside of module gets kind of frozen. It, the execution gets paused, and we put another block of stuff onto the stack, and this is where we're working within. Um, from rotate stack, we would call, for example, the first line list new. So we freeze rotate string, um, and we execute list new. That then returns, so we resume rotate string. We then call string next. That returns, we, we resume um, rotate string, and so on. This happens a few times until we return from rotate string and we uh, resume the module. So we can actually inspect what is going on inside the stack using the inspect module. So inspect.currentFrame gets us the current frame that's on top of the stack currently. What's inside it? Well, firstly, we have the state. So we have the locals that we have talked before. We have the globals that we have talked before. And we have what I want to call the instruction counter, but Python doesn't really call it that, um, which is where we're up to in the execution of the current function in terms of Python's bytecode instructions. We have the code, which is the code of the function which doesn't change between calls. So it's not part of the state, but we need it to be able to run our code. This is the bytecode, names of the parameters, all the constants that we have, because remember that globals um, are a dictionary, so we need to save all the strings with the globals names. Um, the file name of the current, um, of the file that the function was defined within, so we know which globals dictionary to look at. Um, we have the debugging information, which is stuff that is not really necessary to run, but it helps us debug the current line in the file, the names of all the locals, we keep them, even though we don't need them, and the previous frame, which itself has all this information. And I think the best way to actually explore this um, is to get the current stack frame and set a breakpoint, which drops us into the Python debugger, and we can use the the command to look at everything that's inside, and whatever you type will just be executed and you'll be able to see the output. So for example, the stack frame has fback, which is the reference to the previous stack frame. fcode is the code. Um, fglobals is fairly self-explanatory. And the code itself has a bunch of really interesting things as well. Code underscore code is the actual bytecode, which you can just look at. Let's use this to do something bad. I want to make an object that's immutable. So the usual way to do this in Python is to have a few private attributes. And an attribute is private if you put an underscore in front of it, which is easy to get around, and it's just not good enough. No, what I want is this. Inside my initializer, I want to be able to set attributes Outside my initializer, in any other method, I want it to fail. And if I try to set an attribute of my object from outside the class, I want, to fail. I want that to fail as well. So I only want attribute setting to succeed within my initializer. You could do this, where you just modify the dictionary like I talked about before, but I don't like that very much. I hate the syntax. I'd much rather do some clever model programming. So let's overwrite set attribute. Um, we need to import inspect, and we need to get the current stack frame. And now we need to work out whether to allow this or not. Um, 
So the first constraint that I want to put is I want the function call, uh, tr setting the attribute to be the init, done the init function. So we can get the name of the function that was calling us. So that's inside code. That's the name of the function. Um, so if it's not init, I want to raise. It should fail. Cool. But how do I know that this is the correct init function? It could be the init within another class. Well, one thing that I can't do is I can't get a reference. Uh, I can't get the actual function from the stack frame, which is not great. But instead, remember, I can get the code for the function, the code object. And I can get the code object from within my initializer. Now, if these are equal, uh, if my functions are equal, then the codes are also going to be equal. If the functions are not equal, but the codes are equal, I'm OK with that, because they're going to do the same thing anyway. So let's compare them. Um, and if they don't match, then we'll raise. Um, lastly, I want to make sure that my initializer is modifying the correct object. So I don't want my initializer to actually be modifying a different object uh, from the same class, but not self. So we can look at the locals dictionary, look up self, and make sure that we match. However, this doesn't necessarily work. And the reason why is that the name self is merely a convention. So in this case, it would fail. Um, but instead, we can actually get a listing of all the variable names within our function. So all we need to do now is look up this variable name, um, look up what the first name of the first variable is, and look that up in our locals dictionary. And if it doesn't match with ourselves, then we raise. Cool. So now we're pretty confident that we are being called by the initializer, um, and thus we can uh, call super uh, set attribute and allow this to proceed. And we find that this works great sometimes. Um, <laughs> it doesn't currently support inheritance um, or closures. So if you have a function inside your initializer, it will just fail. Um, also, you can easily work around it, even though it is slightly harder. Um, However, you can use stack inspection for good. So for example, in Python 2, the way you call a method on your superclass is by having to pass in the name of the actual, your current class and also self. Whereas in Python 3, you can call super without any arguments, and it will do the same thing. Python Future does some clever tricks with stack inspections, uh, very similar to what I just showed you, to figure out what the current class is and what self is and to pass that into the super function, backporting super with no arguments to Python 2. Let's talk about even worse things. <laughs> I have seen good uses of go to statements a few times, um, both times it made my code cleaner. Um, <laughs> You can use them to break out of multiple loops, which is, I think, a thing that would be great in Python. But then you get a genius who implements something stupid with just go to statements because they are a replacement for loops. Um, and let's not forget um, Apple's go to fail from a few years ago, where this misplaced um, go to statement caused all of iOS and macOS devices to be. Uh, to have insecure SSL for a long, long time. So let's give Python go-tos. <laughs> Lucky for us, there is already a go-to statement decorator on PyPy. So you can just install that, um, and it will give you a function go-tos, and it just works. It's fantastic. I didn't write it, but let me explain to you how it works. It involves disassembling a function. So if I have a function, such as this one, I can disassemble it to get the bytecode, which is a series of instructions that Python executes um, when it executes your function. So it doesn't actually 
So it turns your code into these steps, and then at runtime, it executes these steps. Uh, there's a few things you should note here. So the first column of numbers, two, three, four, five, are the line numbers, and we start at line two. Um, zero, two, four, six, eight is the byte that the instruction starts at, an instruction in Python 3.6 is two bytes. Then you have the name of the instruction. So uh, load const loads the constant one here, and store fast stores that into the local um, at index one, because remember that locals are stored in an array. And in this case, um, the disassembler helpfully tells us that the name of this local is result. Um, and the second last column where we, that goes 1, 1, 20, 0 is an argument that you can pass into the instruction. Um, so in case of the first instruction, that's with, uh, loading from with, uh, the first index of an array of constants. Um, the argument to store fast is 1, so we're storing at index 1 of the array and so on. I'll point your attention to instruction 22, which is jump absolute, which takes us from line 22 and jumps back to line 10, to instruction 10. And we have a helpful arrow telling us that at some point we jump to this instruction. Um, because that's essentially all that go-tos are. You're just jumping from one place to another place. So I have, a, I have some code with go-tos, and I'd like to disassemble it. Um, if you're not doubtful of this, perhaps you should be. And the reason why is it's not clear to us why we should be able to disassemble this at all. Label and go to are not Python keywords. So if it doesn't parse, you should not be able to disassemble it. Well, there's a clever trick here. Um, and in fact, it, it does disassemble. And the reason why it does disassemble is label.loopBuddy just means that you're looking up the label global and you're finding its loop body attribute. It doesn't matter that the label doesn't exist. It will nonetheless successfully compile to bytecode. Same with go to loop body. Um, you can see this here, lines four and line nine. We load the global, we load the attribute. We don't do anything with either of those, so we just pop it off, off our stack. Um, and we do the same when we have our go-to. So all we need to do with the label, because it's just a placeholder, replace it with no ops, and replace the go-to with a jump absolute to that instruction. Um, and if you want to be slightly more optimal about this, um, you can actually get rid of those no op instructions um, and forget the strings label, loop body, and go to because you're not using them anyway. Um, and the actual implementation is here. It's only about 200 lines, but it does a bunch more error checking, which is, I guess, helpful, even though you're using go to's anyway. <laughs> this works perfectly well. Um, I got it on the first try, so I was really happy. Um, <laughs> You can do the same thing with switch statements if you want. <laughs> I challenge you to do this. <laughs> um, yeah, I would not want to be in a position to maintain your code if you use any of these tricks. They are nonetheless very fun to know about and knowing about them helps us understand how Python actually works underneath. So we've got some time for questions if people want. Uh, I'll run around and give you a mic and you can ask Jacob for his opinions. Or we can have none of Jacob's opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, even if we go out early, the lunch won't be available until, I think, like 20 past anyway, so, uh, yep. So no questions? One, one question. <laughs> so let's say someone actually thought this was a good idea and tried putting it in their code. How, how would you actually go about explaining why, please don't do it? Like, 
let's, let's say they actually thought that it was the right thing to do. Um, can you give me specific examples? Do you mean the cold stack inspecting or changing the bytecode? Let's, let's say they genuinely thought that implementing some horrifying case statement thing was the right way to express their problem. How would you go about explaining that a more Pythonic solution would be nicer? Look, if you can justify it to me, I expect that this might be the right solution in a very, very, very small fraction of cases. In general, though, these things are really hard to maintain because you're relying on um, behavior that's not guaranteed to not change. So for example, Python changed its bytecode uh, standard of, for, at Python 3.6. So we now have instructions that take two bytes. Previously, they were longer, which meant that the person who wrote that library actually had to go back and maintain their old bloody code um, to support go-to statements in Python 3.6, um, which is a slightly crazy thing to do. Um, furthermore, it's, you're using tricks that most people don't know about, um, and you're very likely neglecting a bunch of edge cases as well. Right in the middle of the road. Yeah. Uh, with the first example where you try to like make it immutable, could you also achieve this by like in your init function by rewriting the setatra function? Instead of using the stack <laughs> inspection stuff? So So you uh, like you know A equals one and then Self dot set under under set atra equals other function that doesn't allow writing to happen, so you won't have to do any stack inspection. Right. I have not thought about that. Um, I. <laughs> um, I've never actually given um, a Python object a method outside the class. I, I'm sure someone here knows whether or not it will happily bound to the bind to the method. Oh, if it does, then I guess that's a reasonable way to do of doing it. <laughs> However, it also means that you have this particular ugly line of code in your in your initializer, which you might not necessarily want. We want this to be clean. So if we can just hide all of this away. Um, uh, it wouldn't be in your initializer. I think you'd actually override def under under call and then intercept any attempt to get to the under under set func, and then that would allow you to to set out a so. So my question is: Is this a good idea? I'm phrasing my so. The question is: Is my answer a good idea? <laughs> no, hang on. If you. Um, if you override down the call, but that's just overriding when you call an object. You're not overriding calling any of the object attributes. So you're not actually overriding uh, calling set attribute at all. You just need to accept that stuff is called. We'll talk about this after. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said just before that you're worried that you might put something in your dunder init which might look bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's a big concern of mine. Is it? Could you possibly avoid that by maybe using meta classes? <laughs> Look, either way, you will end up with a clean init function. <laughs> so, just wanted to check. Um, are you actually able to change the bytecode by default in a running Python script? Like it's part of the we're all consenting adults thing? <laughs> or is there some special config you have to set to be able to do that? Um, you can do it. It's, I want to say it's non-trivial, but it doesn't require anything that's not in the standard library. Um, you have to play around with bytes, and you have to use like special constructors for functions. But if you have a bunch of instructions um, as bytecode, you can actually make a function out of it. So it's a matter of 
taking the function, getting its bytecode, switching it around, and then making a new function from that bytecode, and you can totally do it in plain Python. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, another sort of silly question is, um, could you do the go-to statements with AST manipulation, or does it have to be bytecode? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it's much easier when you can get Python to do the work of parsing it and turning it into bytecode for you. If you're making your own bytecode from scratch, you're going to have a bad time. To put it lightly. Any other? <laughs> Have I missed any hands? No, all right. Thank you very much, everyone. I am sorry. For <laughs>